this ends in yet. Let's turn it around. Let's turn it around. Brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of Africa, scattered throughout the connection of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, I greet you in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. One heart, one way, one way, one heart. I also greet and welcome all people young and old, who join us for this service of worship from wherever they are in Africa and throughout the globe. I take a special moment to acknowledge and greet all mothers throughout the globe. On behalf of all children, I salute mothers who are the backbone of society, and I wish them all a happy Mother's Day. I come to you, friends, from the Chapel of Christ the Seventh at Seth Mokidimi Methodist Seminary in Peter Meritzburg. Thank you for receiving me into your space. Grace and peace from God our Father, creator of the universe. Love and joy from Jesus our advocate, savior of the world. Fellowship and communion from the Holy Spirit, our guide and life giver. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we gather to worship, to worship. May every space in which we are, may every instrument we use to connect to the service, be dedicated for holy use, to the glory of God. Amen. We are now going to light the Christ candle, reminding ourselves that Christ is the light of the world, and in him there is no darkness at all. Remind ourselves that Christ is the light of the world, and we are the salt of the earth. Remind ourselves that Christ is the light of the world, and we are the chosen disciples of Christ. For our prayers this morning, I have chosen two compositions. The first one by Isaac Watts, O God, our help in ages past. And the second one 
by H. H. Dunmore, Kulungkulu Destra. I will read these compositions slowly and thereafter invite you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. I will say it in English and you may say it in any language of your choice. Let us pray. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal hope. Under the shadow of your throne, your saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is your arm alone, and our defense is sure. Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting you are God to endless years the same. A thousand ages in your sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Again, we pray in the words of H. H. Dagmo in Isiswati. Kulungulu destralo, kulungulu despetro. Ukutotonke tinzawo, ngatotonke letikaz. La petinkanyeti inukona wene zuluini, o uvele se ukona, tisenge eko la potona. Tia uzeti peletonke, kutisha balani onke, kepawe nange kupele, utabe solo ufeli. Amen. I now invite you to join with me in prayer as we say the Lord's Prayer. Please, I invite you to say in your mother tongue or any language that you are comfortable with. I will say it in English. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, we come to the ministry of the Word. Our scripture reading for this Sunday is found from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. Come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen and precious with God and be yourselves like living stones built into a spiritual house until you become a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices which are well pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. For there is a passage in scripture which says, Behold, I place in Zion a stone, chosen, a cornerstone, precious, and he who believes in him shall not be put to shame. So then there is preciousness in that stone to you who believe. But to those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner, and a stone over which they will stumble, and a rock over which they will trip. They stumble because they disobey the word, a fate for which they were appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a people dedicated to God, a nation for him specially to possess, that you might tell forth the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. You who were once not a people and are now the people of the Lord, you who were once without mercy, and have now found mercy. Friends, I commend this to you as the word of the Lord. Amen. 
when I was still at school, I was not very good at playing sports. Thus, I never participated in any sporting codes. But now, as a parent, one of our children is a 12-year-old daughter. Her name is Abongile, and she won't be very, very pleased with me for speaking about her in public. My daughter is a very keen sportswoman. She particularly excels in netball and basketball. At the beginning of this year, she was chosen to play for the first team of netball and second team of basketball at school. The joy my child expressed when she was chosen, that is, picked, selected, nominated, appointed to play in these teams cannot be put into words. Just from her reaction at being chosen, I learned something that it is both an honor and a privilege to be chosen for anything. To be chosen means that there is something special about you that is seen about yourself, about your character, about the way in which you conduct yourself. There's something about you that renders you a cut above the rest. But being chosen also brings with it a responsibility. First team players of netball at school have to train a bit harder than others. They have to display more discipline than others. They have to make more sacrifices than others. And so being chosen carries with it both an honor and responsibility. In the passage we have read this morning, we come across the word chosen a couple of times. In fact, from the version of the Bible I have read, the word chosen appears three times. I've also looked in the NIV and I've also looked in the Good News Bible. It also appears three times there. It is this word, chosen, that I have decided to use as the title of my message today. I propose that we explore this subject under three headings. Namely, chosen to be a spiritual building, chosen by God's design, chosen for peculiarity. The revised common lectionary, year A, places the reading on 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 10 in the fifth Sunday of Easter. As you may already know, Easter is not a day or an event, but a season of 50 days that begins on Resurrection Sunday and ends on Pentecost. During Easter tide, not only do we continue to be wowed or struck and amazed by the miracle working power of the resurrection, we also tap into the promise of Easter. You see, Easter promises us life instead of death. Easter promises us light instead of darkness. Easter promises us victory instead of defeat. Easter promises us that the power that raised Jesus 2,000 plus years ago is still at work even today. Therefore, Easter tide is a season of discovery and rediscovery. And so first Peter informs us that as Easter people, we should know that we are chosen. First Peter informs us that as Easter people, we should embody our chosenness. First Peter informs us that as chosen people, we should in the power of Easter, endeavor to live differently. This brings us to the first point I want to make, chosen to be a spiritual building. The COVID-19 pandemic has destabilized many people's understanding of what it means to be church. 
when it was first announced by the state president of the Republic of South Africa that church assemblies are cancelled under the lockdown regulations, many people were justifiably upset. And when the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa wrote a letter indicating that in view of the president's directive, indeed, church meetings should be suspended, many people were even more upset. They were upset because to their minds, the church is a place where people go to. In other words, these people regard the church as a building. Peter offers a teaching that contradicts this view. The church is a building. This view is similar to a sentiment I discovered on the Clergy Coaching Network Facebook page. They posted on the 20th of April, and I quote, keep a Christian from entering the church sanctuary, and you have not in the least bit hindered his or her worship. We carry our sanctuary with us. We never leave it, close quote. And so Peter compares the church to a spiritual building. The builder of the church is God. The building material of the church is not made up of clay, bricks, and mortar, but of living stones which are human persons. Peter goes on to claim, in keeping with the Old Testament teaching, that the building known as church was begun by the laying of a cornerstone, that is, a solid stone that God has set as a foundation for the entire building. This cornerstone, Peter claims, is Jesus, and the building project of the church began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a miracle when Jesus rose from the dead. But it was even more of a miracle when the resurrection of Jesus Christ inaugurated a new spiritual building known as church. It was a miracle when Jesus rose from the dead. But it was even more of a miracle when Jesus chose you and me to be participants in the telling of the resurrection story. From the event of the resurrection, we begin to appreciate that the church of Jesus Christ is not a place that people go to. The church of Jesus Christ is what we become when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. The resurrection is an invitation for us to become storytellers of the miracles that God is performing in the world. And story terrors of God's miracles become spiritual houses that are not stuck in one place, but are dispersed throughout the world to tell the story of love, the story of grace, the story of peace, the story of justice, the story of compassion, the story of sacrifice that God once told in the world. So wherever people gather, in the world today. There the church is. So do not be discouraged that we cannot gather together in the way we used to in sanctuaries to worship. Rather be encouraged that today the spiritual house of God that was envisaged when Jesus was raised from the dead has now come alive. And so if you are a believer, if you are a child of God, saved by grace and cleansed by the blood of Jesus, wherever you are, there the church is. So you, through Jesus' work, have been chosen to tell the story of the resurrection. And so today, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, you are participating in the service from your home. You may possibly be in your car or wherever you may be. Just know that your presence in that space is then a symbol of God's heart.
heart present wherever you are. And so wherever you are, if your life is built on the cornerstone who is Christ, you are part of a spiritual building known as church. And so Easter tide is a time for all of us to discover that we are chosen to be church wherever we are. This teaching, friends, is very challenging to me because it calls to order the artificiality of many Christian people who assume that Christian life is compartmentalized. It calls to order the artificiality of those people who assume that the Christian life is compartmentalized. Many of us have mastered the art of becoming holy people only for one day of the week. And for the rest of the days, we become evil. In our pursuit of artificiality, many of us have even set aside clothes only to be worn on Sunday or when we regard ourselves as holy. In our masked artificiality, we even have assumed a particular manner of walk and talk on Sunday and come Monday, we become different in our walk and talk. On Monday to Saturday, we become vulgar we become less loving, we become less forgiving, we become less united, and then comes Sunday, we raise our hands and declare, we worship you and we praise God. What utter artificiality. And so Peter teaches us that you are church not only when you gather on a particular day, but you are church everywhere you are every second of the day, every minute of the day, every day of the week, whether you are able to gather with others or not. Peter reminds us that we are the building blocks of the church of God and the foundation of that building is Christ himself. Just imagine with me for a moment, a building built upon Jesus for a moment. You see, Jesus is love. Jesus is just. Jesus is holy. Jesus serves. Jesus is compassionate. Jesus empties himself. Jesus is righteous. Jesus is caring. Jesus is humble. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is peaceful. Jesus is light. Jesus is good. It goes without saying, therefore, that all those whose lives are built upon the foundation of Jesus, who is the cornerstone, are chosen to embody these attributes. So wherever you are, when, whenever you show the goodness of the Lord, whenever you show the love of God, whenever you show the peace of God, Whenever you show the compassion of God, you become a living church and a testimony to the fact that upon you, Christ has built his church. Peter is very dramatic in portraying the truth about Jesus as the cornerstone of the spiritual building of God. He says that the political and religious leaders of the day rejected him. But God chose him and placed him as the cornerstone of this building. You see, the old temple of Jerusalem was made with material stones where material sacrifices were being offered. Now, through the resurrection, that temple has been replaced with a new temple of living stones. In this new spiritual temple, everybody offers a sacrifice of love together with Christ. A sacrifice of holy life together with Christ. A sacrifice of compassion, righteousness, and justice together with Christ. And through them, they then become the foundation of building a society that is different to what the world would be when Christ 
was not there. This brings us to the second point of our message. Chosen by God's design. We're chosen to be a spiritual house. But we are chosen by God's design. Is it not fascinating to see an all-knowing and all-powerful God choosing to partner with fallible human beings to fulfill God's purposes? Why does God, who created everything out of nothing, choose to work alongside that which God has created? It baffles my mind. And from this passage, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, to suggest that human beings are worthy of being chosen by God. In fact, if you read this passage again, and I invite you to do it, every reference about human beings is negative. In this passage, human beings rejected Jesus, the cornerstone that was chosen by God. Human beings stumble and trip upon the cornerstone because of their disbelief. Human beings were in darkness and had to be called out of darkness because of God's wonderful love. Every reference to human beings in this passage is negative. They do not deserve to be chosen. Why does God then choose them? Peter is not really upfront in telling us this. Somehow, somehow, as Christians, when we come to the moment of receiving the sacraments in the Eucharistic liturgy, there's a prayer known as a prayer of humble access. We get from that prayer an idea of why God chooses human beings. And the prayer and the words of that prayer go something like, Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. But it is your nature always to have mercy. And on that we depend. And so feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may forever live in him and he in us. Friends, I want to suggest to you that therein lies the answer. We are chosen not because we are worthy. We are chosen because God is merciful. We are chosen not because we are worthy. We are chosen because God is worthy. We are chosen not because we deserve, but we are chosen because it is in God's nature to always choose us, even though we reject him. In fact, the concluding verse of Peter's passage encapsulates this idea. He says, once you had not received mercy, but now you have. So, so let's, let's talk about mercy for a second then. Let's talk about mercy. A loving God, a loving God chooses people deliberately. He knows are going to reject him. A, a, a loving God chooses people deliberately whom he knows are going to turn their backs towards him. A, a loving God chooses people deliberately whom he knows that they are going to confess the Lordship of Jesus through their mouths, but their hearts and their actions will not testify to the same. A, a God chooses, chooses intentionally people he knows will be divided among each other and will cause hurt to each other and will break down the world that he created in love and declared good. A loving God chooses us. How wonderful. That is mercy. In fact, we call it grace, undeserved favor undeserved kindness, undeserved love from God to undeserving people. I don't know who said it, but someone said, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. So it is not anything we have done, but, but it is God who does it, because it is in God's nature to choose to love instead of hate, to, to choose to unite instead of divide, to choose to build instead of break down, to choose to flourish instead of destroy, to choose to heal instead of wound, to choose to care 
instead of disown. And that is in the nature of God. Let's talk about grace for a minute, for a moment. This grace is prevenient, chosen by God's design. Grace is prevenient. This means that this grace goes ahead of me. It goes before me. It, it precedes in front of me. Even when I have not come to realize that, that I need God, this grace is prevenient. This grace is above me, covering me and offering me shelter even if I have not asked it to. This grace is, is beneath me, lifting me up when I struggle to live life. That is prevenient grace. The grace that is at work even in the one who openly denies Jesus as Lord, but God's grace is that. This grace runs after me. When I choose to turn my back to God, God comes running behind me, calling me back, come, come, your home is with me, your place is with me, my heart longs for you, come, even as I run, prevenient grace catches up, catches up with me, chosen by God's design. You see, this grace is justifying. You see, justifying means uh, to be treated just as if I had never sinned. You see, when, when the prevenience of grace of God catches up with me, an awareness to my own fault and my own sinfulness arises out of my heart, and it is that grace that pleads and begs with my heart to offer my life to Jesus. And at the point of my confession, when I say I accept you as Lord and my Savior, then God cho chooses me for justifying grace to be treated just as he... I had not sinned for my slate to be wiped clean. And then the work of the Holy Spirit starts in my life. And this grace, therefore, becomes sanctifying. That, that is, it makes me, it makes me uh, daily, daily, daily. You see, salvation is not something of the past. Salvation is not an event. Sa salvation, it is something that happened, that continues to happen. And shall happen. You see, salvation is something is something amazing because because I was saved. I am being saved. I shall be saved. You see, salvation can, cannot just be left to that day when I encounter Jesus. Salvation is a present reality, a daily encounter with God, a daily experience of the Holy Spirit as I am made more and more like Christ. And sanctification then comes up in that place. And at the end, then I begin to produce what Paul in Galatians calls the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, and gentleness. And then, this is the power of being chosen by God's design. And, and therefore, friends, I, I cannot claim that I am standing in front of you because I am perfect. I, I cannot claim that I have been given this responsibility to speak of holy things because I am holy. I cannot therefore boast about how good I am in front of you, but all I can boast about is grace that lifts me up, that touches me, that makes me a child of God. And so at that point, I want to share with you today is we are chosen for peculiarity, a, a big word, a big word even for me from an amount. We, we are chosen for peculiarity. You see, peculiarity means different to what is normal or expected. Peculiar means strange, distinct, unusual, and out of the ordinary. Of all those who are chosen by God are chosen for peculiarity. You, you see, they become strange. And in one place, Paul says, they become even strangers and aliens in the world because they, they just are chosen uh, to be peculiar. I, I'm not in a position to tell what, what Peter's audience would have reacted or how Peter's audience would have reacted when they first heard his words. Uh, I, I hope that, that they reacted with joy, but I suspect if they knew that they were chosen to be peculiar, they would not have rejoiced. There's, there's a juxtaposed paradox 
in Peter's words as he describes the kind of community that these people become when they are chosen by God. He, he, says, he says they are a royal priesthood. I don't know about you, but, but royal and priesthood in my mind can, cannot stay next together. You see, when we talk about royalty, we talk about power, we talk about authority, we talk about palace, we, we talk about artillery and weaponry, we, we talk about privilege and honor, we, we talk about title, and, and so I, I struggle to, to put royal and priesthood next to each other, because when we talk about priest, we talk about dispossession. When we talk about priests, we talk about a temple instead of a palace. When we talk about priests, we talk not of power but of vulnerability. When we talk about priests, we talk not of title but of loneliness. When we talk about priests, we, we talk not about being served but becoming a servant. And so when you become part of the community of God, you become part of a peculiar community that lives with these juxtaposed paradoxes. You are called at the same time to be royal, but you are also called to be priest. In, in other words, you are powerful because the Spirit of God lives within you, but in, in the same way that power should be used to bring others to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You, you are powerful because the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives within you, but you should use that power to draw others with you to Christ. You, you are powerful because the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is still working within you and working with you and working through you, but that power should not be used to stamp upon others. It should be used to drag others with you to where God there, to where God wants them to be. They are destinies. Their destinies depend on you. And so as a royal priest, there are people whose de destinies are tied to the work of your obedience. And so you, you are a, a peculiar people. You see, you are a, a peculiar people in a world that would rather treat others as, <laughs> as nobodies. A, a people of, of peculiar circumstances would, would want to affirm somebody's worth. In a world that would rather live with war and disunity, a people of peculiarity would rather choose to live in peace. In a world where everyone wants to live on their own and be disconnected from everybody else, a, a people of peculiarity would want to bring and, and build communities together. I, I, I guess, I guess, the words of the Wesley Guild pledge are, are words that speak to, to, to this idea. You see, Wesley Guilders are people who desire to live and lead a, a Christian life. This means that Wesley Guilders desire to be a peculiar people. You see, the, the Christian life to which we are called is a life of paradoxes. It is a life not of popularity, but a life of humble obedience to God's will. It is a life not of competing for the spotlight, but it is a life that allows the light of God that is deep within us to radiate through the cracks of our brokenness so that those who are in darkness are all are able to see their way through the light that shines through us. I remember days when Wesley Gilders would sing, brighten the corner where you are, brighten the corner where you are. Jesus is there right where you are. In my mind, those Wesley Gilders were saying, we want to be, we want to be peculiar. Where darkness has become the light of this day, Wesley Gilders are saying, the light of God should be the light of this day. Where people are no longer ashamed to front their sin publicly, to be clapped hands for, Wesley Gilders are saying, we beg to differ, where people choose to live in ways that degrade other people's lives, Wesley Gilders are choosing to say, I desire to live and lead a, a Christian life. And they say, by the grace of God, and so chosen by the grace of, the, the grace of God. And so it is peculiar today for people to be dedicated to God. It's not fashionable 
to be associated with God today. Anyone who declares their allegiance to Christ is viewed with suspicion, is mocked in the present culture of the state. Thus, it is safer for many to deny the faith than to profess it. And so Peter tells his audience that, listen, you, you're not called to be fashionable. You're called to stand out. Peter tells his audience, you're not called to, to go with the flow. You're called to swim against the tide. Uh, Peter tells his audience, you're not called to, to fit in. You're called to just stand out. You're not called to just be. You're called to, to be peculiar. It is peculiar to become part of the discipleship movement. You see, when you belong to God, there, there are certain choices that you make that make you unpopular. How do you stand for uprightness? In a society where everyone else is surviving by bending the rules? How do you stand for justice in a society where everyone is making money out of exploiting the poor? Isn't it easier just to follow the tide than to stand against what is happening? How do you ever stand for truth? In a world where lies sell and lies become profitable today, how do you stand for truth? You are chosen to be peculiar. And so be, because we are chosen to be a spiritual being, a spiritual house, chosen by God's design and chosen to be peculiar, we too then become the building blocks of society. No society has ever its life upon liars. Because liars have no standpoint. Today they agree with this, tomorrow they agree with that for as long as it is profitable for them. No society has ever built itself upon fear. Because thieves will steal from this yard today and when they have exploited that yard to its destruction, they go and looking for another yard from which they will steal. No society has ever been built upon thieving. No society has ever been built upon immorality. In the name of progress, Many people have viewed immorality as the norm. No society has ever been built upon immorality. But if you are a spiritual house of God, and if you are chosen by God's design, and if you are a member of this peculiar community, you, my dear friend, are the building blocks of society. And the society needs you. And so let us close. You are chosen. Please rejoice at your chosenness. But also remember that to be chosen carries with it responsibility. As a chosen person, th there's great expectation from you. Yeah, we, we should talk about these things. There's great expectation from you as a chosen, as a chosen person, as a person built upon the cornerstone that is Jesus. That's great expectation for you. You see, as a person built upon Christ, many people look to you as a role model. Many people look to you as someone they can point their children to. Many people look to you as example of how life that is full and meaningful and significant should be lived. Many people watch you because you are chosen and there's expectation. They will not come and tell you. You are fortunate if somebody comes and says to you, I've been watching you for the past five years. I've been watching you for the past 10 years. I've been looking at you for the past 20 years. 
come and tell you that in the depth of their corners, in the depth of their minds, in the depth of their hearts, they are using you as an example of how best to live and express yourselves. And so friends, live as a chosen person of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are now going to pray. And I am going to ask you in joining with me in, in prayer. I'm just going to suggest certain topics for prayer. And I will ask you in your space right where you are to pray silently or aloud for those conditions and situations that I am going to suggest for us to pray for. First, let us pray for the Church of Jesus Christ to become strong during these trying times. Let the Church be the voice of reason, beacon of hope, symbol of unity and all that is good. Let the Church become a prophetic and healing community. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa and all the bishops and ministers and leaders of our churches. Let us pray for leaders and bishops of all churches in Southern Africa, in Africa and the world over. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us pray for leaders of the nations of our connection, our state presidents, our prime ministers, our kings and queens, and all who have authority to govern. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for solution against the coronavirus pandemic. Let us pray for those who are sick as a result of this virus and those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones through this pandemic. Let us also pray for healthcare practitioners who daily are at the forefront of the fight against the coronavirus, who put their lives at risk so that we may be saved. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now pray for our own personal needs let us pray for our families and loved ones. Let us pray for our friends, close and far. Let us also remember those friends and family members with whom we cannot connect because of the lockdown situation we find ourselves in. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And if you are able to stand wherever you are, I am now going to ask you to stand so that we then profess the faith of the church. I will say the Apostles' Creed slowly in English so that you may follow me in saying it. So we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us receive God's blessing. Thank you for joining with us today. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen.